Uh, hello, uh, Professor Cleary, and uh, hello, everyone. So welcome to the Open Forum uh, webinar. So uh, today we are very happy to uh, have Professor Matthew uh, Cleary from uh, University of Sydney to give us a talk. And the title of the talk is uh, MMC Form uh, Stochastic uh, Multiple Mapping Conditioning Computational Model in Open Form for Turbulent Compression. Uh, so before uh, the talk, uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Professor Cleary. So uh, Professor Matthew Cleary's research interests are in the computation modeling of uh, turbulent combustion and two-phase flows. His work focuses on stochastic models for large early simulations and is, and is best known for co-developing the sparse Lagrangian multiple mapping conditioning method. Uh, normally we call it LMC for sure. So this is a probability density function model that draws upon concepts that originated in conditional moment closure model, CMC model, and preliminary model to achieve uh, closed, accurate, and affordable solutions for turbulent uh, reacting flows involving uh, complex chemistry, uh, multiple phases, and uh, nanoparticle formation. Through the development and the dissemination of the open source software called the MMC Form, which actually is also a topic of uh, uh, today's talk, and the MMC LES model has been widely adopted by researchers from different universities. Professor Cleary's recent uh, research has focused on supersonic combustion and uh, rotating detonation engines, soot formation, and uh, a new accurate and a uniquely converging uh, volume of read VOF method for interventional LES. It is uh, called uh, the explicit volume division model. So now, uh, Professor Cleary, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Huang Wei, for the nice introduction. And uh, well, it's good afternoon from here, but uh, whatever time of the day it is uh, where you are, um, uh, thanks for coming along. And uh, I look forward to delivering this talk, uh, MMC Foam, a Stochastic Multiple Mapping Conditioning Computational Model in Open Foam for Turbulent Combustion. Before getting into the talk, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, MMC Foam and its applications to a wide range of cases has been a very collaborative effort. Um, and here I list, I won't read them out, but here I list collaborators, uh, students, postdocs uh, from a range of universities in Australia, Germany, uh, India, and Singapore, who have helped in the development and application of MMC foam. So I thank those people. So a brief outline, I'm going to perhaps uh, cover material that is already familiar to most of you, but it is a, a fairly broad audience, I think. So I'm going to talk about the turbulent closure problem and the rationale for multiple map, the multiple mapping conditioning model. Then I'll move into an introduction to MMC foam, which is a hybrid Eulerian Lagrangian approach for solving the governing equations. Uh, I'll then demonstrate uh, two important concepts, that is hybrid consistency between the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes and numerical convergence. And then I'll move on to some examples Samples and they, they are listed there. There's, there's a, a benchmark case, the Sandia flame series, stratified flames, spray flames, soot and aerosol formation, and supersonic combustion. The focus today is on the method and the code. Uh, and so these examples will be presented just as brief illustrations of its application. I won't be going into any detailed discussion of the results. It's just a, a, an illustration. And finally, conclusions, and then hopefully time for questions and, and answers. Okay, so the turbulent closure problem, what do we mean by that? Well, if we look at the transport of some scalar phi in a flow, okay, uh, where phi can represent mass fractions of chemical species, the number density of an aerosol or uh, energy such as enthalpy, uh, then we have this transport equation. Now, the interesting thing about this is the left-hand side of that equation is linear with respect to phi, which means that the left-hand side is relatively easy to deal with, whereas the right-hand side is generally non-linear. So the right-hand side involves a 
source term, W. Uh, if we are talking about chemical species, then W is the chemical reaction rate, uh, or it can be the transfer rate to the gas phase from solid, liquid, and fuel components. And these reaction rates tend to be highly nonlinear. If we're talking about the transport of aerosols, then the source term can represent nucleation, breakage, agglomeration, and so on. And if we're talking about energy, then the source term is the rate of heat loss or gain. Now, if we're talking about radiation, that's typically uh, proportional to the temperature of the fourth, which demonstrates its highly nonlinear nature. So if the flow is turbulent, then a numerical method to solve equation one must either resolve all spatial and temporal scales, and we call that DMS, or it can apply some kind of statistical modeling, and RANS and LES are the obvious examples there. So let's consider LES, which is the focus of today's talk. Um, so here in LES, we deal with the moments of the statistical distribution. So we decompose the scalar and the velocity fields into filtered and subgrid parts. So the instantaneous scalar is equal to a filtered term plus a fluctuation relative to that. And if we spatially, spatially filter the equations uh, using mass weighting, we end up with eventually equation three here. So the source term, which I mentioned before, is that the left-hand side is reasonably easy to deal with because it's linear with respect to phi, but the right-hand side is not easy to deal with because of the non-linearity. And the, the main point here is that the uh, filter or the average of the non-linear function is not in general equal to the function of the average value of phi or the filtered value of phi. We could, of course, introduce higher order terms, for example, through a Taylor series expansion, but the higher order terms tend to be large or can be larger than the leading order terms. So how do we deal with that? Well, there's two broad approaches that I want to discuss. The first is manifold methods. Um, so the original concept here was introduced by Burke and Schumann way back in 1928. Uh, and in this approach, the non-linearity is confined to an infinitely thin and fast reaction zone. So the flame in a non-premix sense, a non-premix flame is considered to be thin and reactions occur instantaneously so that the, um, uh, the flame front is infinitely thin, as I mentioned. Okay, to solve this, Burke and Schumann linearly combined mass fractions of fuel and oxygen and introduced a new scalar beta. Okay, now the way that they've, they've presented this here, where S is the um, mass ratio of oxidizer to uh, fuel, uh, beta is what we call a conserved scalar. So it means that its source term is zero everywhere. And consequently, the equation for beta is linear everywhere, even at the flame sheet. So it's introduced a, a simpler way of solving it. Um, here, we consider a normalized conserved scalar, which we call the mixture fraction, okay? And the mixture fraction is just a combination, is, is beta, okay? Where beta here is a value somewhere in the flow and beta zero is the value in, the, in, in one fluid stream, for example, the oxidizer, and beta one is the value in the fuel stream. So for a two stream mixing problem. Okay, so then what you do is you solve a transport equation for that mixture fraction. Because the source term is zero, it's relatively easy to do. It's, it's linear with respect to that mixture fraction. Okay, and we have some sort of a turbulent flame here. The magenta line is the stoichiometric mixture fraction. Everything on the inside of that has a mixture fraction greater than the stoichiometric value. It's fuel rich. And everything on the outside of that is fuel lean, has a mixture fraction less than the stoichiometric value. So this gives us the mixture fraction distribution in a turbulent flow, um, or the mixture fraction field in a turbulent flow. And now if we consider that this flame surface is infinitely thin, which is what Burke and Schumann did, we can then determine the concentrations or the mass fractions of fuel, oxidizer, and product species via some sort of a piecewise linear uh, set of functions. Okay, so at some point in the flow, say where the, where the cursor is or the, the laser pointer is now, that's a fuel rich condition. So whatever the value of the mixture fraction is there, we would go across to this figure. 
Okay, and then moving up, that would give us, of course, there's no oxygen in the fuel rich side. Uh, we know what the fuel concentration is and we know what the product concentration is. So that gives us the instantaneous mass fractions of the component species. And then if we want to examine statistics of that flow, for example, the mean of the scalar, then we integrate over mixture fraction convoluted by some quantity here, F, which is the probability density function for the mixture fraction. And we have functions where we can, uh, you know, we can presume the shape of that PDF. So despite their simplicity, uh, manifold methods endure today. They are a conceptual foundation for modern turbulent combustion models, such as flamelet and conditional moment closure approaches. And I'll briefly mention them in a minute. Um, they are also a model for laminar or turbulent flame structure where resolution is not sufficient. For example, if we have burning occurring around a droplet and a spray flame and we're unable to resolve computationally that, that boundary layer around the droplet, we can use a, a, a flame sheet or a manifold. Uh, and they, also, they are also pedagogically elegant. So they're handy conceptual models for uh, teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students. An extension of manifold methods, or the, the Burke, so an extension of the Burke and Schumann approach, uh, advanced models like conditional moment closure and the flamelet, various flamelet models. So of course we have this non-linearity, which says that the average or filtered quantity of a non-linear function is not in general equal to the function of the filtered scalar. But if we conditionally average that source term, Okay, in other words, if we take its average or its filtered quantity on the condition that another quantity, eta, is equal to some value, okay, then we largely eliminate the nonlinearity and we have this equality here. Now, this only works in certain circumstances. So it will work in non premixed flames with low levels of local extinction. And here, eta is the mixture fraction. Okay, so we can see here, this is some experimental data. Um, the scatter data, the black dots are, are the experimental data points. The green line is the Birkin and Schumann solution. And the red dots are the conditional mean on the mixture fraction of the experimental data. So we can see it's somewhat like the Birkin and Schumann solution, but um, not quite. Okay, there's some, um, some difference there due to um, non-equilibrium effects and local extinction. As the turbulence increases, as is the case on the right-hand side here, this is a, a flame with a higher Reynolds number, the departure from the Burke and Schumann solution is greater. In premixed flames, eta is the temperature or something like that, like a reaction progress variable. And some experimental data over here shows concentrations or mass fractions of chemical species versus the temperature. And you can see that again, there is a good correlation of those species concentrations with the temperature. So that's a good quantity for conditional averaging. In general, eta is a low dimensional manifold. So it could be the mixture fraction in non premixed flames, the temperature or something similar in, in premixed flames, or if we have partially premixed or stratified flames, then we can use both the mixture fraction and the temperature. Okay, so switching now to an alternative approach to to dealing with this nonlinearity, we talk about the probability density function or PDF methods, where we solve transport equations for the full statistical distributions of a random variable phi. So we can either model the joint PDF of both the scalar and velocity, we call these joint velocity scalar PDFs, or as I'm going to talk about today and has been the focus of my work, we can solve the PDF of the scalar only. And then we can use some other approach to obtain the moments of the velocity field. So here we would have a hybrid method where we're solving a PDF for the scalar, and we might use RANS or LES to solve the um, velocity field. So we define the PDF of the scalar field. So scalar, the scalars here can be multidimensional. Okay, we can have a, 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 a one scalar representing all the species in a combusting flow uh, plus energy. Um, so it's a multidimensional PDF. 
And the PDF is defined in equation five here such that the integral of that PDF over some um, uh, range is equal to the probability of finding the scalar within that range of values. So once we have the PDF, okay, assume we have it somehow, and I'll show you how we get that in a minute. Once we have the PDF, we know all of the statistical information uh, we need about the scalar distribution. So we can calculate the first moment or the mean of the distribution. Okay, we can calculate the mean square or the variance of the distribution, and we can calculate higher moments as well. So it gives us all the statistical information we would ever need about the scalar field. So I won't go into the derivation, but the PDF transport equation is written here in equation seven. Um, so F is the PDF of the scalar field phi. Uh, it has an unsteady term, it has a convective term and a spatial diffusion term where DE is the effective diffusion coefficient, which might include some turbulent component as well as molecular. Now, the really interesting thing here is that the chemical source term, the non-linear term that gives us so much trouble, appears in exact form. It's not the average or filtered value of that source term. So we're dealing with the non-linear term in its exact form. So that's the big advantage of PDF methods. Uh, the downside is that the PDF transport equation has an additional term on the right-hand side here that does not appear in the normal scalar transport equation. Okay, so this is um, what we call the conditional scalar dissipation. It's the term which deals with the effects of molecular diffusion on the distribution. Okay, and, and its, it's, its role is to reduce scalar variance. Now, because the PDF is highly dimensional, it has uh, one dimension for each of the chemical species under consideration. Um, it's highly dimensional and therefore it would be impossible to solve it using a finite volume or finite difference approach. So instead, the continuous PDF transport equation is recast as a series or a system of stochastic differential equations and solved for an ensemble of Pope particles. Okay, these are named after Steve Pope, who developed this method um, decades ago. Um, so we solve for an ensemble of particles which move stochastically according to these three equations here. Okay, so the particles move in um, physical space. Uh, the composition of the particles changes due to reactions and S, which is a mixing term to deal with this difficult term on the right hand side of equation seven. Okay, and the constraint on that mixing model for conventional PDF methods is that when you mix, um, uh, it, is, it is local in physical space, such that the mixing operation does not change the mean values. The mixing operation reduces the variance, but it should not uh, affect the mean values. Okay. So we solve for an ensemble of Pope particles, and these Pope particles represent the discrete mass density function, and we can obtain the moments of that particle distribution by integrating or summing over the particles. So we can find the mean or the filtered, the filtered mean and the mean square. And this figure here is just to give you a demonstration. On the left-hand side, we have an Eulerian flow um, solution for a mixture, a, a non-reactive scalar. And on the right-hand side, we have um, a particle field which is following the stochastic differential equation. So this is just for a non-reacting scalar and the purpose here is to demonstrate the equivalence between Eulerian and stochastic Lagrangian representations. So there are two issues with PDF methods. Uh, the first is we need a mixing model to deal with the conditional scalar dissipation and although these topics have been researched for many years, very few satisfy um, all of the principles of turbulence. They work in some respects, but they violate other principles. And this leads to some shortcomings. The other issue is the computational cost. In order to have local mixing and also obtain um, accurate statistics, 
you would typically need of order 10 particles within each Eulerian cell. And then in an LES simulation, you'll have of order um, 1 million cells, which if you do the maths leads to 10 to the seven particles. And now if each of these particles is being expected to compute nonlinear stiff chemical kinetics with you know, detailed chemistry, many species, then that is obviously computationally expensive. So the method works quite nicely, but the computational expense for many years meant that its application to practical cases was limited. So what's the solution? The solution that we propose, and that is the basis of MMC, is to combine the manifold and PDF concepts. Okay, so without much fanfare, I'll introduce now the stochastic MMC equation. So MMC is multiple mapping conditioning. It was developed by uh, Alex Klemenko at the University of Queensland and Steve Pope at Cornell University in, in 2003. And it has both deterministic and stochastic forms. And what we're dealing with here today is the stochastic form. Now, what you'll see uh, on the screen here is that equations eight, nine, and 10 are very similar to the conventional stochastic differential equations for solving the PDF that I showed a couple of slides ago. Okay. Um, so, from the outset, the advantage of stochastic MMC is that it is a full PDF methods, method, which means that the chemical source term is treated exactly and does not need to be approximated. So that's its advantage. Uh, the other advantage of MMC is that it introduces an additional constraint on the mixing model. Remember I said before that the, mixing, the job of the mixing model is to reduce the scale scale of variance and not affect the mean. And in conventional PDF methods, this is done by ensuring that mixing occurs only between particles which are close to each other in physical or X space. In MMC, we enhance that constraint by ensuring that the mixing is also local in a manifold space. And that manifold is eta, okay? In, it's very important in MMC that this manifold is defined and solved independently. So we solve an additional transport equation for um, the reference variable. And then we ensure that mixing between poke particles is local in both reference space, the manifold space and physical space. In fact, what we can do is we can trade good resolution in the manifold space, eta, and relax the requirement for perfect localness of mixing in the physical space. Okay, so you can reduce the number of particles and still obtain quality solutions. And by reducing the number of particles, we can um, reduce the computational cost. The disadvantage though, is that we are now imposing a manifold concept on top of the PDF equations. Now, I suppose from one perspective, this extends the PDF equation to solutions where a manifold is the true solution. Okay, but at the, at the same time, it reduces the generality of the PDF equation because the manifold typically depends on the type of combustion which is occurring. If it's non-premixed combustion, then the manifold would likely be the mixture fraction. If it's premixed combustion, then it might be a temperature related quantity. So to date, various reference variables have been defined. Um, um, we, in RANS, we've introduced a stochastic um, reference variable. So we solve an additional stochastic differential equation for the reference variable, okay, which has a random walk term here on the right-hand side. Um, in LES, we can be a little bit, um, it's a little bit easier, in fact, because uh, we can use the filtered um, fields, the Eulerian filtered fields as reference variables. So we can solve an additional transport equation on the Eulerian LES grid, for example, the mixture fraction, and then we can interpolate that value to the particle locations. And then we ensure that mixing between particles is local in that reference mixture fraction space. Um, in premixed combustion, we have MMC, stochastic MMC models for premixed combustion. I'll show you one 
uh, later on today uh, that uses a temperature-based reference variable. Um, we could also use quantities which somehow represent the distance to the flame surface. So the whole point here is that we want mixing to occur between particles um, so that um, there is not a molecular mixing, uh, the effects of molecular mixing are not occurring across the reaction zone. We want mixing to occur through the reaction zone and localness in the manifold space achieves that aim. Okay, so using localness in a reference space leads to um, low cost simulations using a sparse distribution of particles. So in traditional PDF methods, we have of order 10 particles per um, LES or RANS grid cell. Okay, so it's a hybrid method where we have an Eulerian solver and a stochastic Lagrangian solver uh, on top of that. So in traditional methods, in order to achieve localness in physical space, you have to have many particles inside each grid cell. Um, in MMC, because we are enforcing localness in the reference manifold space, we are able to relax that requirement for local, local localness in physical space. And we can use sparse distributions of particles. So here, we would typically have fewer Lagrangian or Koch particles than there are Eulerian LES cells, and that greatly reduces the computational cost. So the way that works is we have here in this in this diagram three sorry four particles A B C and D, and they are moving within a flow field. And the contours here show um, mixture fraction, the reference mixture fraction solved on an LES grid. Now, if we were interested in mixing between particles that were local in physical space, then particles A and B would, would mix and that would uh, achieve good localness in physical space. But as we can see here, between A and B, there's a very steep gradient of the mixture fraction. And if there's a steep gradient of the mixture fraction, there's also a steep gradient of, of the reactive species. So while you may have localness in physical space, you have violated localness in composition space. And this will tend to lead to bad results. For example, over predicting the amount of local extinction or incorrectly predicting the propagation rate of a premixed flame. Okay. If on the other hand, we were interested in mixing, which is perfectly local in composition space, particles A and C may mix because as you can see, they both have similar values of the mixture fraction, which means they also have in a non premixed flame similar values of the composition. But A and C are quite far apart in physical space. Okay, and, and it would not be a good idea to mix those particles because that would introduce excessive numerical diffusion and would also likely lead to poor results. So what we tend to do is we trade good, good, good localness in physical space with good localness in composition space and come up with some sort of a compromise. And so particle D, mixing between particles A and D would be that compromise. So the way we choose particles is to minimize um, the square distance in an extended space, which is given by the distance between particles in physical space X and the distance between particles in their reference space. Okay, and these quantities here are normalized by model parameters. And I won't go into it today, but we've developed a fractal model, a fractal view of turbulence at the subgrid scale in order to relate these parameters. Okay, so now I'll move on to uh, an introduction to MMC foam. So uh, MMC foam, um, which is uh, compatible with open foam, um, version 2.x was originally developed in 2013 at the University of Sydney. And uh, that was done um, by my, at the time, PhD student, Yipong Ge and, and myself. Um, it's evolved rapidly since then. Uh, and there are developers at the University of Sydney, Queensland, Stuttgart, University of New South Wales, uh, IIT Kanpur and the National University of Singapore and users in those countries as well. Uh, in 2017, version 4.x was released after a major uh, restructure by um, Sebastian Galinda Lopez, uh, who was a PhD student at the time and now Dr. Sebastian Galinda Lopez um, at the University of Sydney. And he generalized the code, um, expanding its capability beyond non-premix combustion. Uh, 
version 5.x was released in May 2018. And subsequently, there was another major restructure of the spray code. So we do spray combustion as well by in a joint effort between IIT Can4 and the University of Stuttgart. Uh, currently, um, we've been using the Open Foam Foundation version, uh, openfoam.org, but we are exploring um, uh, a, a ESI compatible version of MMC Foam. And we're currently working on version 2012, but we'll then extend that to more recent versions as well. So that's a collaboration between the University of Stuttgart. Jan Gertner is doing that and, and the University of Sydney. So MMC Foam is structured like the base open foam code. Of course, we have you know, application solvers and utilities and we have the source. Uh, there are now um, seven or so solvers in MMC Foam. MMC Foam itself is the base solver developed from row pimple foam. Uh, but we introduced the stochastic differential equation solver on top of that. And that is for non-premixed turbulent combustion in either RANS or LES. Uh, we then have MMC spray foam um, for uh, liquid fuels. Uh, and we have uh, a related version, MMC multi-phase foam for solid fuels. So it's been used for modeling the pyrolysis, the pyrolysis and combustion of, of coal particles. Uh, MMC PBE foam uh, is a population balance equation solver for looking at aerosols. Um, we have RANS, which I mentioned before, and then we have um, uh, a premixed and stratified solver, which introduces um, a manifold on, in, in, in a temperature space. Um, shadow position foam is uh, another premixed solver. And then uh, recently, we are working on a compressible solver for supersonic combustion. So the figure here shows the structure of the source code. So we have an MMC block and a multi-phase block for sprays and solid, solid particles. Uh, today, I'm just going to look at the MMC block. So the MMC block um, is broken down into clouds and particles. Okay, again, the name Pope here is, is after the originator of this PDF method, Steve Pope. Uh, and within these, the cloud, of course, is just a, is a, a container class for the particles, but the clouds do some of the operations as well. Um, and we break the physics down into different areas. Okay, so we start at the bottom with the basic open foam particle class. Okay, and then we add advection to that, stochastic advection. Then we add thermodynamics to that. Uh, then we add sectional, which is for the population balance equation when we have um, uh, lumped species and aerosols. Then we add mixing. So this is the mixing operation in PDF methods, uh, in local in, in, a, in, a, in a manifold space. And then we add the reacting layer for chemical reactions. Okay, so we build the physics up uh, piece by piece. Uh, and then underneath each of these physical attributes, we have submodels. Okay, so for example, um, in the mixing layer, we have um, various MMC models. So this is MMC based on a curls model interpretation of mixing. We also have non-local curls models, so that's not MMC. And then we have a, a RANS related mixing model. Um, this, this particular figure is a little bit out of date and we've now introduced additional mixing models for different reference variables. Uh, in the reacting layer, we also have um, different uh, sub-models. So we have um, you know, fast chemistry, we have finite rate chemistry. And again, it's a little bit out of date. We have um, chemistry which uses um, tabulation and dimension reduction and other related solvers or other related sub-models. Um, in the thermo layer, we have different ways of dealing with the density coupling between the Eulerian solver and the Lagrangian particle solver. And I'll briefly mention that soon. And in the sectional layer, which deals with aerosols, we have submodels for different sorts of um, uh, nucleation and condensation. So the template classes, so each of these layers here is the template class and it's used to segregate the different physical processes. I've already mentioned the starting point, but I'll move on now that we can then assemble these template classes um, in, in different ways. 
So a simple flow might be where we just have um, advection, thermodynamics and mixing without chemical reactions or aerosols. So we can then assemble the layers starting from the particle class, add the advection class, the thermo class and the mixing class. And with that, we could solve turbulent uh, non-reacting flows. A more complex case is when we have aerosols in the sectional layer here and chemical reactions, and we can assemble the template classes together to form this more complex object. So the simplest way to build up these capabilities um, is shown in the left-hand figure here. So we simply start with the base open foam class, and then we add to that advection, thermodynamics, sections, mixing and reactions, okay? Um, but this is complicated because these physical processes, although we have attempted to isolate them in the code, they're not completely isolated, okay? There is some interconnection. For example, mixing affects gaseous chemical species, okay? And the chemical species which mix are in fact part of the thermo template class because this deals with thermodynamics, okay? so. While this is conceptually simple, we found that it does not work very well and it makes code um, extension very difficult. So instead, we use this hub and spoke architecture, which is shown on the right hand side here. And we introduce a um, transported PDF data class, which ex extracts the transported variables from each of the physical sublayers in the, in, the, in the structure and stacks them together um, at runtime. Um, depending on the situation that we're solving. Okay, so quickly, uh, I'm going to move now on to um, hybrid consistency and numerical convergence. These are vitally important um, considerations. So hybrid consistency is, is that we need to have um, consistency between the Eulerian LES solver and the Lagrangian stochastic particle solver. Okay, now in incompressible um, flows, this consistency is generally that the mass of the fields represented by both the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes needs to be the same. Okay, um, so the mass summed over all the particles. Okay, so N here is the mass of a particle, P is a particle index, must be equal to the total mass of the system and the spatial distribution of the Lagrangian mass should match that of the underlying continuum Eulerian field. In compressible solvers, um, we will also need to be careful that there is um, uh, much rather precise consistency between the energy of the Eulerian solver and the particle solver. And that's something that's giving us quite a bit of trouble at the moment. Um, so this consistency, I'll just talk about the mass consistency today, is achieved by two method, by two uh, complementary approaches. The first is that we must have consistent initial and boundary conditions between the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes. And during time evolution, we must have accurate two-way coupling between the Eulerian and Lagrangian fields. So this is particularly problematic in sparse methods where if we look at the sparse method here, we have some grid cells that do not have even a single particle. So how could we possibly extract the mass or the density from the particle field and impose that or balance that with the mass or density of the underlying Eulerian solver? In conventional PDF methods, that's somewhat easier because you have many particles per cell, but these are stochastic particles and they, you know, the stochastic noise can de destabilize the solver. So um, even in traditional methods, you need to have some appropriate way of coupling the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes. It's just that in sparse MMC, it's a more acute problem. The way we deal with this is to define an equivalent composition on the Eulerian grid. So essentially what we do is we solve additional equations for the composition. We call it the equivalent composition because it's not the real composition, but a helper composition to achieve mass consistency. So we solve a transport equation on the Eulerian grid for equivalent composition for various species, the species that dominate thermodynamics. Uh, it has a source term on the right-hand side, 
but that source term is taken from the particle field. So the particles influence the composition and ultimately the density and the mass of the Eulerian field through the source term. So essentially what we do is we relax the Eulerian field towards the particle field. And we do that via approximating the conditional means on the particle field and then relaxing um, the Eulerian field to that estimate of the conditional mean over some time scale, which is a relaxation time scale, which is determined by numerical considerations. Uh, we estimate this conditional mean in the source term by um, a method that has some similarity to smooth particle hydrodynamics. We integrate over radial basis functions with localness in the reference space and in physical space. So we've demonstrated this mass consistency. This is for the Sydney Inhomogeneous Inlet Burner studied experimentally at the University of Sydney. Uh, it has a retractable inner tube here and the composition of the gases at the burner outlet can vary. Uh, we looked at a case where the mixture was homogeneous at the outlet and another case where the mixture was inhomogeneous. Uh, and we looked over many, many time steps to ensure that the mass, the total mass of the system was balanced. So the black line is the Eulerian mass. The red line is the stochastic mass. And you can see that they're pretty close. It's a small error, but uh, we, that, that's, that's acceptable. Uh, and down the bottom here, we are showing uh, scatter plots of chemical species versus the mixture fraction. The red points are the stochastic field and the black points are the equivalent species on the Eulerian grid, which are obtained by that relaxation that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So the figure here demonstrates quite good consistency between the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes. Another critical issue is numerical convergence. Okay, all approaches must be numerical convergent, but this is, um, uh, uh, we need to be careful to demonstrate that when we are using a sparse distribution of particles. Okay, so, when we have a sparse distribution of particles, we do not instantaneously know the full PDF, but we can accumulate statistics temporally. Okay. Um, and we can achieve that with a very small number of particles because of the localness of mixing. But we have demonstrated for a DNS case, this is the Hawks um, mixing layer uh, with hydrogen fuel. Uh, we've demonstrated a numerical convergence over a three order magnitude increase in the number of particles. Okay, so we, we, we have uh, uh, numerical convergence uh, and the, the consistency here shows that we can achieve good results with very small numbers of particles and low computational cost. Okay, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm just quickly going to run through some of the um, examples uh, just to give a highlight of the cases that MMC foam has been applied to. The benchmark case for all um, methods is the Sandia um, flame series, uh, which is a piloted um, methane um, air, air flame. Uh, and the, the classic cases are flames D, E, and F with increasing velocity. And as the velocity increases, the extent of local extinction and departure from the manifold increases. So we simulated this uh, using 2.35 million LES cells and one Lagrangian particle for every six Eulerian cells. So it's, it's rather cheap, okay, six times cheaper than if you were doing LES and just computing the reaction rate from the, the LES grid. Uh, it was solved um, using a 30 species, 184 reaction mechanism. Uh, and results for flame F, the most difficult case are shown here. The lines to look at are the black lines. Uh, and you can see there's very good agreement for the conditional temperature at different downstream locations and also uh, for the, the variance or the, the, the standard deviation of the conditional temperature. And likewise for the carbon monoxide mass fraction. The black lines are the ones to look at. They were um, solved using um, a dynamic model for the time scale of mixing between particles in our mixing model, but I, I won't go into the details today. Uh, another um, interesting case um, is the Darmstadt um, turbulent stratified flame. This is work led by the University of Stuttgart. The flame, it's, it's a burner here where there is a central pilot and it's surrounded by two slots and a co-flow. Um, the velocity and the, and the equivalence ratio of these slots can be, can be varied. Um, the case that was considered was um, flame A, where the pilot and slot one both have an equivalence ratio of 0.9 and the slot two has an equivalence ratio of 0.6. 
Um, so, that, so, so slots one and two have compositional shear, okay? But the velocity of slots one and two is the same, 10 meters per second and slightly greater than the pilot velocity. So this is a premix or a stratified flame. So here, localness was um, achieved for mixing between particles that were close in both mixed refraction space and a temperature related space. Here, the reaction progress variable was used. And the reaction progress variable is obtained from an artificially thickened flame model sold on the oil area and grid that used a flamelet generated manifold for its source terms. But importantly, the stochastic particles used detailed chemistry, um, detailed finite rate chemistry, and there's no approximation for the source term. Okay, so um, there's a weighting here. So we have to mix particles now that are local in physical space, um, uh, progress variable space, and mixed refraction space. Uh, it was conducted using a 0.7 million LES cells, one Lagrangian particle for every two LES cells in GRI 3.0 chemistry. And here are some results. I won't, I won't discuss them in detail, except to say that there is um, good agreement um, with the data at some locations um, and uh, less good agreement at others. Um, and the reasons for this are explored in the paper. So I won't go into them today in the interest of time. Uh, another example uh, was extension of MMC foam to spray combustion. Uh, and here um, we have modeled, uh, again, this is led by the University of Stuttgart. We have modeled um, the Sydney needle spray burner. Um, this is with ethanol fuel. Three different flame cases were considered with different um, uh, mass flow rates of the gas and the liquid. So that there's a needle in here which introduces liquid fuel um, and the distance here between the needle and the burner outlet determines how dilute the fuel is, how, how dilute the, 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 the fuel spray is. So here we need to introduce now some additional considerations into the stochastic model because there is evaporation and mass is transferred from mass and species, fuel species are transferred from the droplets to the stochastic particle. So we introduce a source term into the transport equation, the stochastic transport equation for the composition. And we need to solve additionally uh, a transport equation for the mass of stochastic particles, which are now varying due to that evaporation. It was solved using 2 million LES cells, one Lagrangian particle for every eight LES cells, and numerical convergence was demonstrated, and a 58 species 278 reaction mechanism. And uh, there's some reasonably nice experimental data. Um, uh, we explored comparison between model and experimental data for the south and mean diameter of the droplets. Okay, uh, quite good agreement, uh, certainly as good as other models, uh, if not better, that have explored these cases. Uh, this is the temperature versus experimental data. Um, and then final figure I want to show for this case is uh, across the top here, we have the three different flame cases. ETF1 has a largely non-premixed structure. Okay, so conditioning on the mixed refraction or localness in mixed refraction space is expected to be good, but there is some uh, uh, complex flame structure over here on the rich side. Uh, flame ETF4 has uh, some premixing, so we get a partially premixed structure here, um, which is interesting. There is no experimental data to compare to except to say here that the model is able to capture different flame structures and it's yet to be determined how accurate these are. Okay, I want to briefly mention um, extension of MMC foam to studying aerosols, um, uh, either uh, aerosols for um, nanoparticle synthesis or soot. Okay, and here I'm going to talk about soot. So soot, of course, is a carbonaceous aerosol particle. Generally, it's undesired. Um, the way we deal with that in MMC foam is to um, break the soot dist size distribution down into lumped species. Uh, the lumped species are abstract soot chemical species, which represent um, a certain um, size of particles within a narrow range, but they can have different structure, but we just, we just section them into um, particle size. Uh, and then we solve mass fractions, we solve equations for mass fractions of these species, these lumped species, 
And from that, we can then calculate the number density of those species. So NS here is the number density of a lump species alpha. W is the molecular weight. NA is the Avogadro number. And on the right-hand side, we have the mass fraction and the density. So soot is complicated because there is soot nucleation, there's surface growth, there's coalescence and agglomeration, and then ultimately oxidation. So we have developed a, um, a sectional scheme, okay, which is a, an abstract set of chemical reactions which represent nucleation, surface growth, coalescence, agglomeration, and oxidation. So it's the interaction of soot lump species with the surrounding gas and with each other. Okay, so we tested this against the Delft three turbulent sooting flame. Um, I won't go into all the details in the interest of time. Uh, it's a very large flame. The computational domain is about one meter long because soot is formed well downstream. So it's a very expensive um, simulation to perform even with us and completely possible, impossible if you are using a PDF method without a sparse distribution of particles. So even here, we had uh, about a million um, Lagrangian particles. The reason it's so expensive is that it's, it's very detailed chemistry. When you include the lumped soot species, it has 107 species and uh, 1,358 chemical reactions. Okay, uh, so we were able, the nice thing about this Delft three flame is that it has uh, detailed composition experimental data in the upstream region prior to the formation of soot. So Raman Rayleigh measurements prior to the formation of soot. So that allows us to test the model and the, and the code um, and, and ensure we have the correct um, evolution of the jet. And as you can see, it's quite reasonable. And then downstream, although species, gas species are not measured, uh, there are soot volume fraction measurements. The blue line here is the experimental data, and the other lines are um, MMC results for various parameter settings. So what we see is that um, in general, in this approach, the soot forms a little bit too far, a little bit too early. But with the right parameter settings, we can match the um, uh, peak value of the soot. The last case I want to mention is um, an extension of MMC foam to high-speed combustion where compressibility effects, uh, including shock waves, are uh, present. Uh, the burner which was considered is the supersonic burner of um, Cheng. Um, so it uh, has a central hydrogen jet up the middle here where the jet outlet is a sonic condition. Um, and it is surrounded by a vitiated co-flow, which comes from the, um, the, the, the body here uh, through a diverging converging nozzle, nozzle and has uh, Mark II um, at the exit here. Okay, and a, a complex compressible flow forms downstream of the burner outlet. And in the experiments, um, the flame stabilizes at about 25 jet diameters downstream of the burner. So this work was led by um, uh, National University of Singapore, so Quang Wei Zhang, who hosts this series. Um, so now we solve again our stochastic MMC equations, but um, the tricky part comes when you solve the energy equation or enthalpy here. So traditionally in incompressible um, combustion flows, combusting flows, we, we do not consider the um, pressure work and um, viscous work. Uh, these become important in um, high mark number flows. And so they were introduced for the first time uh, and we have now a compressible solver. Um, at the same time, MMC foam was now coupled with a density-based solver rather than a pressure-based solver. That density-based solver um, is RY rho central foam. Um, highly resolved simulations, over 12 million LES cells, um, but a fairly sparse distribution of particles, one particle per every 16 LES cells. So still reasonably cheap to compute the chemistry uh, and, and numerical convergence was tested. Uh, and because it's hydrogen, the number of chemical species and reactions is quite small. Okay, so very briefly on the left-hand side, we show some pictorial views. We get a complex flow structure. This is the instantaneous pressure and we can see the shock waves. 
The second row, the second column here shows um, mean pressure and the, the shock wave, the, the diamond pattern downstream of the burner exit is apparent. Um, uh, and on the right hand side, we show some comparisons between the model predictions and the experimental data for temperature uh, and species mole fractions. So reasonable um, uh, comparison between the model and the experimental data, um, uh, but still room for improvement. Okay, I'm a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that. Um, PDF methods are a universal approach for turbulent combustion, but they are relatively expensive and modeling is required for the mixing. MMC LES combines PDF methods with reduced auto manifolds to provide improved mixing and lower cost. We've developed a code called MMC Foam. It's a very collaborative effort. Multiple universities are multiple countries. It's you know, very enjoyable working with people from all over the place and, 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 and working with them to develop this. It uses a, the power of hierarchical object-oriented programming to add additional combustion and flow physics as necessary. Consistency and numerical convergence have been rigorously demonstrated, and today I um, demonstrated it for a few interesting problems. Um, so that's it from me. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time, but I would welcome questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Clearan, for your very detailed introduction of turbulent combustion and uh, the MMC model. So uh, next, we will move to the Q&A session. So for the panelists, if you have any questions uh, you want to discuss with the Professor Cleary, uh, you just unmute yourself and ask, okay? So uh, let me have a look. Uh, now we have uh, one question from the audience, okay? So Matt, I will read the question for you. Yeah, okay. I, so, I, I, can, yeah, I can see it. Okay, yeah, I'll read again, okay, in case okay. other people want yeah, to. Sure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, so, uh, uh, Professor uh, Cleary, uh, would you mind briefly commenting on the differences between CMC model and the MMC model? So which one do you recommend to use for extinction prediction? Yeah, good question. So um, MMC is CMC and it's also PDF. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework and it's rather flexible. Um, I mentioned earlier on that MMC has sort of deterministic form and a stochastic form. In its deterministic form, it's very close to CMC um, in that uh, it, you solve for conditional means in, a, in an Eulerian a deterministic sense. Uh, and the conditional means are now conditional on a reference space rather than on, on a, 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 a real scalar space. But that reference space emulates or represents the real scalars, but it's just there's a, an element of, of um, independence there. Um, but it can be demonstrated that uh, that uh, that deterministic MMC, if you transform the um, the the space, you can transform it into conditioning on mixture fraction, and the equations are identical. With the advantage that MMC produces the PDF of the conditioning variable and the conditional scalar dissipation in closed form, which CMC um, by itself cannot do. Um, if you're considering local extinction, other you know departures from the manifold, then you should move to um, stochastic MMC, which is a full PDF method, but it imposes um, uh, conservation of conditional means on the solution. So conserving conditional means is always a good idea. Uh, if you're conserving the wrong conditional means, it doesn't hurt you, but it may not help either. So you you ensure that localness in a space that represents the, um, the, the true conditional structure of the flame, for example, mixture fraction and non-premixed combustion um, yes. gives you localness, and, and, but it still allows for local extinctions and departures from the manifold. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, any uh, questions from the panelists? Okay, uh, so maybe i ask uh, uh, one question. So uh, for MMC model, so is it actually possible to use, you know, to model uh, turbulent uh, detonations? So there, if you'd like to resolve the detonation structure, so uh, what what are you know what should we do? You know, for this model, we can directly use it, or some more additional mo uh, models are needed. Um, well, well, the, the work that your group conducted um, on on um, supersonic combustion um, was a, a step in the right direction there. So 
you need yeah. to you need to consider the pressure work and the and and possibly the viscous the viscous work, but pressure work certainly. Yes. Um, and and for uh, supersonic but still relatively low velocity cases, mm -hmm. um, it appears to work quite well. That that method um, uh, neglected subgrid fluctuations of density. Yes. Okay. So, so the pressure work was introduced, but the subgrid fluctuations of not, not density of, of pressure, the subgrid fluctuations of pressure were neglected. And it needs to be um, assessed whether that's a reasonable assumption or not. Um, I suspect in detonations, um, uh, that issue is going to become much more vital that we that we somehow model the um the in, in the end you have to model the conditional pressure work term, okay, conditional on um the composition space and in MMC that would be conditional on the reference space. Um, and we need to really look at DNS data mm -hmm. um, to assess that. So detonations are very difficult because it's a very complex structure um, yes. where you have this coupling between the flame and the leading shock and yes. then the, the, the transverse waves which drive it all along. So um, yeah, complex problem. I, I suspect that um, we need to do a lot more work yet. The other, the other tricky point there is that you need to ensure rigorous consistency between the Eulerian and Lagrangian subschemes, and that's much more difficult to do in highly compressible flows. Okay, so normally, you know, the induction zone actually is very small in detonation, right? So for that case, actually, do we need to put enough particles there, or or it's okay? We can also use a very sparse particle <laughs> um yeah I, I suspect you are going to need more particles ultimately we'd like to use as small a number of particles as possible without compromising the solution so i mean and nmc offers that flexibility um so mm -hmm. it does allow sparse solutions but it doesn't mean that all cases are suitable for sparse simulation so we'll mm -hmm. see um you know it's, it's certainly an interesting problem one that we're we're exploring now but um, there's a way to go before we know how to deal okay. with connections. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, another question from me is about the, um, the TDAC method. So the TDAC method actually it's uh, from open form, right? You, I think you tried in the conference paper, but you didn't use it for the following work, right? So what is the performance? Sorry, sorry I, I, I misunderstood you. Which, which method are you talking about? TDAC, tabulated. Uh, oh, uh, TDAC, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a combination of ISAT, Yes. Uh, in, in situ adaptive tabulation and dynamic um, adaptive right. chemistry. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, we we reported it in a conference paper only because it's not our it's not our method. Okay. We just implemented it within our MMC foam solver. Okay. But we're we are, we are now using that in our in our regular simulations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um. I think we have another question uh, from Quan Wu. So, uh, hi, Professor Cleary, thanks for the talk. And uh, uh, in our recent work regarding the DLB MMC form, we tested the parallel performance up to 512 CPU cores. So do you have uh, tested the MMC form code on more CPU cores for large simulation scales? Yeah, so this is related to the scalability of the code, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So yeah, I know the paper he's talking about, it's, it's under review. Um, uh, no, we haven't. Um, we have not explored. Uh, we've, we've used open foam um, uh, itself to much larger numbers of cores, but not MMC foam. Um, it's generally being applied to sort of laboratory scale flame cases. And, uh, you know, the sweet spot there is, you know, 64 to 128 or, or so processes. So, um, uh, uh, some work was done by um, Zizi Huo, uh, formerly a PhD student here on parallel efficiency. So he's, he's introduced a method, which is now part of the, 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 the main code release um, to distribute. So when you, when you decompose you know, parallel decomposition in, in CFD, you generally decompose you know, um, by volume mm -hmm. uh, and generally with the, the flow field in mind. So you might get good balancing of the um, of the say Navier Stokes solver, but yes. flame um, has you know chemistry is intense in different regions, and so you may not have good parallel efficiency for the calculation of the chemical kinetics. So what we do is we um, uh, distribute the particles um, uh, 
to other processes in yes. order to um, achieve good parallel efficiency for the particle solver as well. So we use domain decomposition for the Navier-Stokes solver and um, uh, distribution of particles using, you know, um, uh, MPI for um, uh, uh, parallel um, efficiency for the particle chemical kinetics. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, so Dr. Sosten had a question. Yeah, please. Yes. Hi. Thank you for the nice talk. Hello. Um, I have a question also about OpenForm. Uh, are you aware of any other MMC implementations and how they compare to OpenForm in terms of performance or accuracy? Uh, so M MMC has, a, it's, it's not one model. So there are other implementations of it. Um, uh, probably not very many. Um, the one I can think of off the top of my head right now is um, the work being done by Andrew Wandel um, at um, University of Southern Queensland and Peter Lindstedt at uh, Imperial College. Uh, I think that's based on Peter Lindstedt's um, parabolic uh, PDF method and Andrew, um, uh, many years ago, but still using it, um, put MMC on top of that. Uh, we haven't done cross comparison because they're sort of different codes. One, one is Peter's code and, and Andrew's code is mainly for RANDs. Uh, it has a slight, or has a, a rather different um, MMC implementation. Same basic idea, but uh, uh, somewhat different to, or quite different to what we have done. So um, uh, I'm not aware of any other working codes. Uh, originally, um, I implemented MMC LES in the Flozy solver from um, uh, Professor um, Johannes Janneke's group at Darmstadt, but that was, you know, Oh, 17 years ago or so, 15 years, 15 years ago at least. So that was what we used originally. And then we moved over to MMC phone, uh, to open phone, sorry. And maybe uh, from the top of your head, are there any features in open form missing that maybe are available in other uh, solvers or uh, tools that might be? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a really good point. There's, there's advantages and disadvantages of um, open phone. Since you asked about the features that are missing, I would say, um, the disadvantages are around things like um, high order schemes. Okay. Um, uh, and so open foam tends to be dissipative, which we're noticing is causing some problems, for example, in supersonic combustion. Um, so that's that's one disadvantage. The advantage of open foam, of course, is that it deals with um, lots of physics. Okay, there's there's so many different aspects of physics are in open foam and you have the ability to, to bring them into your model. So, and in the wide you know, user base and the open source um, sort of structure and things like that, I think are the, are the advantages. But um, higher order schemes is something that um, probably needs work for some applications. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so any uh, more questions? from the panelists and the audience. Okay, um, okay, so, um, okay, so uh, if no uh, more questions, uh, I encourage you as uh, each uh, panelist open your camera and join me uh, uh, thanking Professor Cleary again, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas, nice. everyone. Yeah. And, uh, I'm going on holidays tomorrow, but thank you for having me uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, good luck, everyone.